Okay, everyone, thank you for coming. We're going to get started. Um, happy Wednesday and welcome to our Amplifying BIPOC Voices in Sustainability. I'm Gigi, a student intern at the Office of Sustainability, and I'll be helping facilitate our discussion tonight. Uh, this series is hosted by the Social Sustainability Coalition, an intern team inside the UW-Madison Office of Sustainability. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our conversation about Black entrepreneurship. Before we jump in, we at the Office of Sustainability want to acknowledge the lack of racial diversity in our office. This reflects a larger trend across campus and in mainstream environmentalism where the invaluable voices of Black and Indigenous people of color are often excluded. We've created this series in effort to recenter the voices of those who have long led the fight to protect our community and the environment. We would also like to acknowledge that our campus currently occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land. The Ho-Chunk have lived in a place their nation has called Tejo since time immemorial. The Ho-Chunk were forced to relocate multiple times between 1834 and 1874, but they've always found their way back to Tejo. The history of colonization informs our shared future collaboration and innovation. We want to emphasize that our shared future was never intended to be a land acknowledgement. And in fact, our university has not come up with one yet. The Office of Sustainability recognizes that indigenous people deserve the right to define and control their own food systems and native nations are at the forefront of the food justice movement. The purpose of Social Sustainability Coalition is to expand the definition of sustainability into the social realm, as is often overlooked in the sustainability conversation. We'd like to emphasize that this is a safe space. All opinions, feelings, and experiences are welcome to be shared. So I'm gonna pass it off to Melina, who will um, introduce our wonderful speaker for the night. Hi everybody, my name is Melina. I'm also an intern with the OS, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ruben Anthony Jr. Um, for our event tonight. So Dr. Anthony has been the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison since March of 2015. In the time he has been with the Urban League, they have increased their job placements by 39% and have made nearly 2,000 placements to date. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Anthony has been a senior manager in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. He's a subject matter expert in developing job placement strategies and a minority business development. The majority of his career has been as a manager with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, where he started as a first line supervisor and eventually became the deputy secretary and the operations officer from 2003 to 2010. As the deputy secretary, he managed 3,600 FTEs and an annual budget of $3.25 billion. He was also responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the agency and overseeing the programming of all areas. In 2017, he was awarded the Golden Champion Award by the National Association of Minority Contractors, Wisconsin chapter, for leadership in minority business development in the Wisconsin construction industry. He is leading the fight to build generational wealth for the BIPOC community through home ownership programs, and he is also co-founder of a Black business hub currently under construction. With that, I ask you all to please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Ruben Anthony. It's truly an honor uh, to be with you tonight, uh, to be back on the campus, which is one of my alma maters. I graduated probably before many of you were born uh, from the urban regional planning uh, school right down uh, uh, the street here. So spent a lot of uh, time and years walking up uh, Baskin Mall, walking up that hill, and uh, spent a lot of time uh, studying on the campus. So I have a high regard uh, for the university. So I'm glad to be here tonight to uh, be in dialogue with you. When I think about uh, what you all are doing with sustainability, I think there's some intersectionality uh, between um, your um, interest and, and our work. And so I'll get right into uh, the um, presentation uh, today. I like this um, intro um, um, post that you did. I, I think it's uh, pretty nice. Um, and let me tell you not just about the Black business. Uh, I think to kind of put things in proper context, I've got to talk to you about uh, the Urban League. And the Urban League uh, here has been around uh, since 1968, but the Urban League, the National Urban League, is one of the oldest civil rights organizations uh, in the nation. And we have maybe about uh, 90 plus affiliates across the nation in most um, major uh, cities. And the purpose of uh, the Urban League was to uh, help um, African-American families uh, find their way into 
um, opportunities um, uh, throughout the country. As people were running away from the Jim Crow South, many African Americans that were living in Southern states were trying to come to Northern states. Uh, one, they knew um, how to work hard, um, but at the same time, uh, they needed uh, to find um, placement and good jobs. And there were good jobs in uh, manufacturing and factory uh, type jobs. So it was, it was a good fit. But there were some other things when they got here um, to different states, when they migrated to different states, um, they needed help with housing. Uh, they needed help with um, uh, jobs. Um, they needed help with uh, fighting uh, racial discrimination that was in the North. And a lot of what they um, did um, during the, the, um, the start of the National Urban League, uh, many of the affiliates still do some of that work today because we haven't made uh, all the progress that we need to make in, um, in civil rights and equality. I tell people um, that my um, family um, were uh, migrants, um, you know, during the, a part of the Urban League movement. Um, in 1961, uh, my mother and um, her siblings were living in uh, Mississippi, and they too um, were a part of this migration to come north. In fact, in 1961, my mother was pregnant with me when her and five of her siblings moved out of uh, Mississippi um, to um, not Wisconsin, but to New York looking for those opportunities. And we found a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and so um, uh, it is uh, something that is near and dear to my heart to work um, that uh, we do uh, here uh, at the Urban League. Uh, if you look at this um, slide, it shows um, the four pillars of, um, of our work, our wealth, wealth building, workforce development, uh, community engagement, social justice, and also um, <clears throat> youth development. But I want to show you a, a short uh, video and then I'll come back into the uh, conversation. Uh -oh. Oh, do you have audio? Yes. Concerned about where we go and civil rights. The politics of division has made it more difficult. The climate has changed, and we feel like we're taking steps back. We have to. The Urban League has been making a difference for almost 50 years. The individuals look to us to provide help. They pretty much help anybody who's willing to put in the effort. When we think that jobs are most important to families. The best social program. It's a good paying job. I was looking for anything. It was rough. But actually trying to find a career is very difficult. There are times where you just want to give up. You literally count the pennies. When I started having kids, I wanted stability. I want him to see me as a man that takes care of his responsibilities. It starts with an individual having a good paying job. We make a commitment to training, placement, coaching. I started off in their trades academy. Now I'm the production line lead for the Madison Area School District. I love this family. This is the highest I've ever made in my entire life. Now I can actually afford to have my wife and my son on my insurance. <laughs> 
You kind of walk with the shoulders back a little bit more. Instead, lift a little bit higher. If you have a job where you can provide for your family, that's the greatest feeling in the world. You don't have to worry about going and asking anybody for anything. It changed me because he gave me having those I didn't know I had. What we're doing is we're collaborating. They've been able to have partnerships with major corporations here. Exact Sciences has high quality jobs across the company. We have benefits on the first day of employment. Our minimum wage is $15 an hour. The partnership with Urban League really helps us connect with people throughout the community. They're able to train people for good paying jobs. So we think that if we can help families to be independent, that helps matters to move forward. We're moving in the right direction. They gave us a home. <laughs> we were living with my mother. And it was Devin's idea to go through the Urban League Housing Program. I thought we were going to get turned down like we did for every other program. So when they approved us, I was like, oh, wow. I think that's the ultimate thing that you can do in America is be a homeowner. I really want that stability for my son. Now he has somewhere stable that he can grow up in. People are really trying here in Madison, and we're having some successes. One can always count on the Urban 50 years of really serving this community, and we want to be here beyond another 50 years. The Urban League can provide home. So, push and Last time I sent you to you, that your dad struggled for me and that he can do the same. I want him to see what it's like to be a man. And when he grew up, he'd like to know what my dad was a good man. So, we have lots of great stories about how we've impacted people's lives. And you can hear uh, uh, from uh, his story, uh, the job he got allows him and his family to have a, a sustainable wage, to have insurances and all those things. But everybody in this country uh, just, um, deserves to have um, that top type of opportunity. Everybody in this country needs to have wealth building opportunities to be homeowners. So I'll talk some more about that later. <clears throat> but right now, just to share a few more of our programs uh, before we make it to the um, Black Business Hub, is that we have um, programs where we're working um, uh, with uh, youth uh, in our um, schools uh, mm -hmm. to make them uh, career ready, um, but also uh, to make them uh, ready uh, for college. Um, we have a program called the Schools of Hope that's been around for more than a couple of decades. We're in nine schools, uh, middle schools in um, Madison and two in Sun Prairie. So if any of you want to tutor, we have lots of volunteer opportunities to help these uh, young people uh, learn. We have what we call the 21st Century Careers Program that's at James C. Wright. Um, and also we have two schools in, um, uh, in, in Sun Prairie where we have those programs. But during the school year, they do career exploration. But during the summer, they're able to do internships. And the internships pay 15 bucks an hour for middle school, right? And they, right, and they, they, yeah. <laughs> and they, and they also they get to shadow folks in government, and private corporations, and just a whole lot of other things. So it's a really meaningful experience. So it gives them something to want to work for um, throughout the year and during the career exploration. Uh, we do um, STEAM camp, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math um, during the summer. But we bring the kids on campus to the labs here. We bring them to the Overture Center. We bring them to Madison College and give them experiences of all these things uh, in the science, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, next week, we'll be hosting um, gaming and coding. It's a big gaming industry here in Madison. And so we want to expose these young people to um, science and technology. So we do the game, gaming and coding um, program. We've been doing that for over seven years. A lot of times the kids see the gaming part and they think that it's, it's going to be all playing games, but it's not. It's learning the science. Uh, beneath the gaming and that they end up loving it, you know, afterwards. Um, each year during the Martin Luther King celebration, we have a big uh, celebration at Edgewood High School where we bring almost a thousand people into a gym uh, to celebrate um, youth and their achievement. And we give out um, several scholarships. Our adult workforce development program is a demand driven program where we partner with Industries like exact science, when we know that there's going to be jobs that uh, 
uh, emerge at the end of the training. Most of our trainings are four to five weeks. For example, with exact sciences, um, we've had uh, jobs in lab, customer care, and a host of other jobs. And we've had 13 cohorts with exact sciences and they've hired 94% of the folks that have come through our cohort. Some of the folks who have um, gone and got college degrees come to us uh, too, uh, to try to um, get relationships with some of the uh, corporations that we have. We have a trades program and uh, we're um, with our trades program, uh, we partner with Operation Fresh Start where we do about a five or six week training program the individuals in the program learn how to use the tools. Uh, they get a chance to prepare for the accurate place exam that gives them placement uh, in the trades. A couple of weeks ago, when President Biden was in town uh, in um, the DeForest area, um, the mayor asked me to come so she could talk about uh, the success of the um, Black Business Hub. And there was a young man in the audience. He had his construction hat on and he had his vest on. He looked at me from across the room and I looked at him. And, uh, and we, we finally approached each other and he said, who are you? So I'm Reuben Anthony with the Urban League. He says, oh, I got my training, you know, at the Urban League. And he says, uh, now I make over 30 something bucks an hour. And uh, he says, prior to that, before coming to Madison, I was in Chicago and I was actually on the streets in Chicago. So we talk about, you know, doing programs uh, that really make a difference uh, in, the, in the lives of people. We have teaching uh, certification programs. We're partnering with this university, Edgewood College and the schools. We have a host of uh, employment and training opportunities. We engage in uh, community uh, uh, advocacy and community engagement uh, where um, this week, um, Saturday, we have a mayor at the Urban League starting at six o'clock. So if you wanna hear about what uh, the um, candidates uh, wanna do for the city of Madison, come on out there. We posted uh, vaccine clinics when uh, community members were hesitant about, you know, getting a shot. We brought in firefighters uh, from the uh, from the uh, uh, flame. Um, I can't, can't think of the formal name, but they African American firefighters. They came in there with their shirts and all buffed up and stuff like that. You should have seen the lines of uh, <laughs> coming from vaccines. But it was really um, a great, you know, partnership between us and the uh, fire department. Um, we speak out on social justice quite a bit. You know, we get calls from uh, news media about what do we think about, you know, different things, whether it's Black Lives Matter, police shooting, or just a host of other things. And we do uh, an expungement clinic where already um, this year we have gotten, um, um, I think it's nine um, pardons and 21 expungements. And so we work with the community who need a second chance, and we do quite a bit on that end. Home ownership is one of those things that's in our preview. Uh, when we look at uh, statistics um, uh, across the nation and in Wisconsin, African American home ownership is abysmal. Um, Forty-six percent of African Americans are homeowners across the nation. Seventy percent, uh, uh, seventy percent of whites across the nation are homeowners. There's a bigger disparity here um, in in the state. Only twenty-six percent, you know, of African Americans are homeowners uh, in the state of Wisconsin. You think that's something that's the third worst in the nation. Uh, when we look at Dan County, only 10%, you know, homeowners. Home ownership is that piece that allows us to um, uh, have equity in a home uh, so that we can send our kids to school, so we can start a business, so that we can have retirement and things like that. And so we got to do better. We've given out over um, 74 homes to first time homeowners. Uh, a couple of years ago, we purchased 16 homes in Madison. We remodeled those homes and um, we gave those homes uh, to families uh, and, and, and Madison. And so they get to have um, the equity uh, from the remodel. We've also done um, wealth building accounts uh, where um, they have to, they pay interest only for um, seven years. After seven years, they have to refinance with us. Um, but at the end of that seven years, if they haven't used that money for a roof or some, something else, um, they have that money as well. And so this is uh, truly a, a wealth building uh, opportunity. This is our Black Business Hub. As you can see, it's a beautiful building on South um, Park Street. Um, South Park Street in South Madison is one of the few places in Madison that has a brown and black enclave where we can call our own. Um, when you go to places like California and New York, there's always great places where you can go for ethnic you know, um, um, food and ethnic entertainment. And those places take pride in that. 
And we're calling on um, Madison and Dane County to take pride in it too, to be proud about you know, being able to uh, help uh, uh, our businesses. Um, looking at the statistics uh, for black and brown businesses uh, here, um, we have uh, lots of challenges. Just like we have disparity in housing, we have disparities in um, black and brown um, business ownership. For black people here, it's, it's dismal uh, again um, for the um, businesses in Dane County that have more than one employee, there's about 10,000 of them. And uh, three tenths of a percent, or four tenths of a percent, or um, uh, 40 or so of those businesses are African American businesses. So 40 out of 10,000 or so are uh, African American owned businesses. That's a shame. Um, five times, um, whites are five times more uh, able to start a business uh, than African Americans. Uh, black firms are seven times more likely uh, uh, to fail. Only 2% of uh, black businesses are doing um, contracting with the city of Madison. So we got, some, we got some work to do. If we think about the height of COVID and when PPP loans were being given out frequently, only 5% of those black uh, companies that applied for PPP loans uh, got loans, so 95% did. So we got we to gotta make some changes and the Black Business Hub is here uh, to make those changes. When we look at Park Street, we see gentrification going on there where there's a lot of changes and a lot of wealth is moving in there. Madison is an inelastic uh, city where um, the boundaries don't grow other than the annexation of the town uh, that happened, um, I believe in uh, November. Um, but you know you can only go up, you can take a building down and, and, and then um, uh, build in that place of where you're taking that building down. So it's called infield development. And uh, but that's competitive. And as soon as that those buildings come down, the developers come in and they build up these buildings. And sometimes the rents are two thousand dollars a month or three thousand dollars a month. So the folks that live in that neighborhood, many black and brown people, um, they can't stay there because they can't afford to live there. And so we asked the question um, to the mayor and to the city council and other people about why can't black and brown people be a part of this transformation. In South Madison, there's a transformation going on right now, and we feel like we need to be a part of that. We want to cause a renaissance to happen. So not only is the um, Black Business Hub going on there, you have the Center of Black Excellence that's going to come on in uh, 2024. You have Centro Espano that broke ground a few weeks ago, and uh, you have Brandon Rule that's doing affordable housing. So collectively, the landscape is changing, and we are seeing like a, a, a Black renaissance, and we are to celebrate um, that as well. Access to capital has been a huge challenge for Black-owned businesses. I mentioned about, you know, not having uh, access to PPP loans, because a lot of Black businesses don't have the banking relationship. Sometimes they don't have the credit, sometimes they don't have the home equity, but the bottom line is they don't have access to capital. In the Black Business Hub, it won't just be a building, uh, it'll be programming. We have an accelerator program where we're gonna raise about $3 million uh, to help these businesses have access to capital so they can get grants, they can get loans, so they can scale up. We're gonna work with businesses throughout the entire business life cycle. So new businesses, existing businesses, and businesses that wanna scale up. So we signed a partnership with a group called Generator, which is a national accelerator program. Generator has helped small businesses grow all across the nation. So they offer two courses with us. One is called a G Alpha um, program. And the G Alpha cohort, which is going on tonight, um, they actually work with new businesses and help them, you know, um, determine, you know, how they'll develop that business. They help put these new businesses um, and uh, some of these inexperienced businesses in touch with bankers, in touch with mentors. Uh, and, and, and it's a, just a great you know, opportunity. Um, we've had, we're on our second cohort with the G Alpha um, um, program. In the first class, there were 25 um, individuals. In this class, there are about 15. And so I remember I said there are only 40 businesses, African-American businesses with more than one employee. And already we've trained more than uh, 40 people. Uh, in the G Beta program, it's a more, hands-on intensive program. And so we had five people uh, come to that because that's all about scaling up your business and taking it to um, the next level, uh, thinking about how you scale up or how you scale and exit the business. Um, we'll have uh, 
training, uh, small business training uh, in there. Um, we'll have commodities of scale where you can uh, do group purchasing for HR, IP, and all that. Um, and, and then again, just having the peer support, you know, of other small businesses, uh, you know, that can celebrate and commiserate uh, together uh, when they run into challenges. The good thing about the hub is that we have um, 35,000 square foot feet of the building is going to be market paying rent, um, businesses, nonprofits, and other folks. And so um, that's going to create like a really good positive cash flow. And it allows us to give um, reduced rents uh, to those uh, um, small businesses that uh, uh, will come into the hub. So uh, again, uh, the hub is going to be a four-story building, um, 80,000 square feet. On the, on the top floor, there'll be um, co-working spaces where um, businesses can come where they don't have to go to Starbucks and run their businesses now. They can come here. Um, there'll be um, desks, cubicle, offices, event space, indoor and outdoors. Um, you can have access to conference rooms, technologies, and these are the things that businesses need uh, uh, to survive. Uh, on the lower level, we'll have a commercial kitchen for those folks that are trying to hand at baking, or trying to hand out a food truck. They got a place for cold storage and uh, dry storage, and, and they got access uh, to cooking equipment. Also on the first floor, um, we expect in this area to have um, an Afro-Caribbean restaurant on the first floor. Um, we, have, we expect to have pop-up, you know, maybe about 15 to um, 30 pop-up spaces on the, on the first floor, and then other retail spaces on the first floor. Summit Credit Union will be on the first floor, do banking with the businesses. Um, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation will be on the third floor, um, you know, again, providing grants and assistance to the businesses and attracting businesses uh, uh, to the state. The Black Chamber of Commerce will be in the building. WIDIC will be in the building. We'll have more economic development resources in this building than any other building in the state. This is the inaugural um, uh, um, G, um, G beta um, um, program, uh, and many of these folks have uh, very successful businesses. This is the inaugural um, G alpha um, program where they're doing uh, um, quite a bit as well. So we've raised about $25 million um, so far for the core and the shell of this um, um, building. And the total project cost for the corner shell is $26,000. One of the things that many of the projects uh, that are being built today are facing is 35% inflation or more. So we've got to fundraise for um, the inflationary cost and then uh, for some of our tenant build outs. So I'm going to show one more video and then I'll take your question. When I was 15 years old, I got to go to school. I sat across from a principal telling me, like, you're not going to graduate. Now you're not going to be able to go to college. Every single thing that I care about, like it's going to be gone. Where I come from, it's a place that just seemed desolate. Nobody's doing college. Nobody's doing businesses. When we think about the history around underinvesting in Black and Brown communities, there's a lot of trauma. While Madison is certainly a very resource-rich community, there are different experiences for individuals that are black and brown. There's about 10,000 or so businesses in Dane County with more than one employee, and only 40 of those businesses are African-American owned businesses. I've been doing hair like all my life. I was the first school to eliminate ethnic boundaries in a beauty education sector. I got overwhelmed like a lot of times trying to start it. And I was like, oh my God, what about this part? What about that part? I have so many goals with this school. And I need people that know more than me that can actually mentor me. It looks pretty daunting because you just really don't know where to go when you when you start a business. After I got kicked out of school, I told myself, all right, from this point on, when I come back, I'm gonna get a 4.0. I want to be a role model. I just became a principal. I decided to start my own business working for and with youth of color, particularly Black youth. Some of y'all may be being in this room right now still trying to determine and figure out who you are, what you're going to be about, and that's perfectly fine. I think it's very difficult to build a brand. 
takes network and money to actually, you know, get the resources you need. Where do our Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other marginalized groups go? The Black Business Hub is the missing piece in the region. We don't have anything like this. Finally, there's going to be a spot. People are going to like, you know, be driving by South Park Street going, what's this beautiful building? The Black Business Hub is for the whole life cycle of businesses. We have a space where we can grow businesses, office spaces, co-working spaces, technical assistance, but also a place that will provide an ecosystem to give them access to capital. The hub is going to be transformational. We couldn't do this project without the support of all of the community. We made an investment of $1 million. We play a role in corporate America to be making these types of investments that are centering the community. I need this now. This should not be the end. There should be a hub, dot, dot, dot. My mind is like, you know, that could happen for this community. What else can happen? How you can get involved, you know, you can volunteer to work with uh, some of these businesses. Uh, you can volunteer to help uh, as a tutor with uh, our School of Hope program. Um, you can, uh, uh, for the school here, they can host internships. Uh, you can chaperone um, the kids on, on, on different uh, trips through, uh, game, uh, through the gaming and coding piece or through our, our STEAM camp. And then uh, we've got workforce development training that we do. We have a young professional uh, organization, so folks are under 40 and interested in being a part of that. You know, that's a great group. They've got about 80 members and many of them are um, college graduates and some are not, but they are uh, looking to kind of get mentors for their careers. We provide that as well. So let's talk about the development of BIPOC businesses. that have given us some background about what they did. Who's the facilitator? Thank you so much. I'd like to open it up to any questions that Dr. Anthony. Um, what's your guys' main source of funding? And do you see it changing at all um, in the near future? And also, did you see an increase in funding, especially like the, the, the height of the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, That's a great question. Yes, we, we saw. Um, Increased funding for all of our programs uh, in the urban league uh, during that time. I was just on the phone call before coming in here with our national president, Mark Mariel, and we were talking about uh, uh, is that type of um, care and funding um, drying up? And, uh, you know, and for a lot of affiliates across the nation, it is that, you know, people sometimes check boxes or they do things when you're in the heat of a crisis, but after, you know, the crisis goes over, um, the funding and the support that you got, you know, during that time, it's it's not um, at the uh, at, at, at the same level. Uh, but our funding has come from many um, different sources. Um, we got our first source of funding, two million dollars from uh, uh, Joe Carisi um, with the county, uh, and they have partnered with us for the uh, commercial kitchen. We got another five million dollars from uh, the governor um, to uh, uh, some of the uh, funds that were coming uh, uh, from the feds. Um, uh, we got uh, Pleasant Rolling, uh, the, the former doll company. Um, they gave us a million dollars. Uh, we got a uh, million dollars from uh, Cuny Mutual. Um, we got 500,000 uh, from Exact um, Sciences. We got 500,000 from Holder. I mean, so the, you know, there's a whole variety of folks um, who uh, help make this happen. So this isn't just a, a Black project. This is a um, project where many folks from all um, aspects of the community have stepped up, you know, really to make it happen. Because as uh, I mentioned in the video, when I talked to um, Zach Brandon from the uh, Greater Madison Chamber, he said, this is the missing piece in the region. These businesses are going to have a place to go, grow, and they're not going to stay in the hub. That's just the start. They're going to come on the west side. They're going to be out here with their food carts on campus. Uh, they're going to be in Sun Prairie. 
Verona, and they're going to be other places uh, in the region. So it is uh, a missing piece in the region. I'm curious what type of experiences, like both professional or educational experiences, you and other employees of the Urban League have had in community advocacy before coming into this position? Yeah, um, I spent um, most of my, my life with um, community advocacy types of a training. I'm, I'm here at uh, Madison uh, with my master's in urban um, planning. I focused on uh, community and systems development. Um, and uh, my other master's degree from Jackson State University was public administration. And so the different tools of uh, project management and advocating uh, around there. And then my PhD work, um, I did uh, at UW Milwaukee, I did uh, uh, urban studies and community development. And so a lot of it, you know, had uh, to do with advocacy. Uh, in my career as a, a transportation planner, um, I did what they call ur urban modal planning, where urban, urban modal planning, where I, I did um, advocacy and community outreach about transit and the adverse impacts on our highways. And then I also uh, did project management on um, uh, major highway projects like the Marquette Interchange in Milwaukee, um, where um, we had to advocate uh, to a community that had been damaged by the initial build out, you know, of a, a freeway system. And yet, you know, you got a black person coming in and telling you that we need to do this again to help uh, the economic uh, development, you know, in the city. And so that was tough, you know, in a lot of ways, but we did things where we got the community involved and got the community to share in the wealth of that project as well. So a lot, and most of my staff have, uh, you know, lots of experience in uh, community outreach and advocacy. We have to stay connected to the community, um, you know, quite a bit. Civic engagement is one of our, you know, four pillars of what we do. Others? I'm going to ask the boss. Oh. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, follow up on Maya's question about uh, funding. Um, I'm just curious what sort of support, like in your work, both for the Black Business Hub in particular, but then your work more broadly, like what kind of support do you get both? Monetarily or otherwise, from this institution, from UW Madison. Careful, careful with your question. I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, no, th th this institution is a, a good partner, um, particularly uh, the Chancellor's Office. Um, they support our events, and uh, maybe we get probably up to like sometimes thirty thousand um, dollars or so uh, in a year uh, from them. Uh, we had a biotech um, event last week, and. Uh, Walk um, was there, Upstart was there, and um, and they want to partner more. Um, we partner with um, the law school for a sponsoring clinic. We've met with the business school dean about you know being our partner there, and so um, there's a lot of um, uh, commonality or uh, synergy uh, that um, from this hub that's really going to bring us closer to the university, and we hope that we see a larger investment you know um, uh, moving forward. Oh, I was wondering if you had any businesses like locally owned businesses lined up for the hub already to rent out the spaces, and if so, like what are they or what your favorite? Yeah, um, so um, we're looking at uh, so South Madison is close to being like a food desert, right? There's a you know bunch of different places over there, but there's no place where you can really get healthy food. So we're looking for like someone to come in there with uh, some healthy food, uh, smoothie, uh, juices, and and that sort of thing. Um, you saw uh, the, uh, the beautician in the um, uh, video that we showed uh, at uh, Chanel um, Beauty School. Uh, they're going to be uh, in, in, in the place. Um, we got the Black Chamber uh, that's going to um, be in the place. And then we have, um, uh, we, we're going to have a Black Wall Street area where we have um, Bob Wynn, and I can't ever remember the name of his business. He'll be there, you know, teaching like, um, fi uh, you know, financial management. Uh, we have a black therapist, you know, um, coming in into the hub, and then we have a lot of, um, again, you know, businesses that will be like pop up businesses that come in there. We haven't identified the Afro Caribbean restaurant there, and so we're just now starting um, that thing. Uh, we have um, uh, it's another group that is a black communication group uh, that I can't remember her name right now, so she sees that she's gonna be mad. 
but it, it's a, it's the uh, uh, her her uh, last name is Justice, but they have a communication group. They have a cleaning group. Uh, they'll be there. Um, so we have a host of um, businesses that are um, under consideration. Uh, we just really started a, a vetting process with Park Bank, where Park Bank will you know help us really kind of see um, what businesses um, uh, really um, have uh, the experience and credit worthiness to really um, be able to manage and pay you know for space and and, and there so. Um, just like if you're buying a home, you have to do your due diligence, and that's where we are now with many of our businesses. We have about 70 businesses on the on the list that have uh, expressed an interest in being there, so we're actually vetting businesses as we speak. So, businesses like to have the creditors' experience, will be able to see what is it doing anything like that? Is there a thing for them to do? Yeah, yeah, and that's where um, that's why we have so many. Um, pop-up shops, uh, and those pop-up shops look like uh, some of those shops that you see in the airport, and you see those small jewelry shops and other shops, so where, um, in this case, people are not ready for brick and mortar, but they're ready to try their business. Excuse me. Um, so is the Black Business Hub thought of more as a stepping stone for these businesses and what it can make their own place, or like, the ones that are paying rent to those larger spaces is that can that be a permanent like location for them? Yeah, so it'll be a mix, you know, okay. both. Um, those businesses that are again, you know, making that big time investment and building out their spaces, we're expecting them to be there seven to ten years. But for the pop up, you know, spaces, we're looking for folks to come in there and that they're the future um, tenants, you know, in the building as they grow. Somebody in the back. Um, when is the hospital open? Ah, now the the first tenant, um, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, should be moving in in June, and um, we'll open up um, the space uh, uh, for um, a soft opening in uh, the end of August or September. But for um, we do um, what we call our a Unity Picnic in um, July twenty first or sometime in July. We're going to have uh, tours of the building because it, it should be open. Um, the core and the shell and some of the other spaces should be open. So we're going to do tours during our Unity Picnic. During our Unity Picnic, uh, we have free food, there's barbecue. Sometimes I cook there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we have, we'll have a band there. It's really a nice time. Um, uh, uh, Chris, Chris McIntosh, the athletic director, he's always there. Becky would always come through. Um, there, so it's a lot of folks that are from the university come because they have the UW partnership, you know, over there. We work closely with Brenda Gonzalez over there at the UW partnership. So um, it, it'll be, I mean, if any of you ever want to come and um, explore that space, you know, once we get open, let me know. No, when we, uh, when we were selecting sites uh, for um, the space, uh, we worked with the uh, urban planning school to bring in uh, like uh, for one semester, um, the students to work on like what would be the best site for us to locate on. And this actually was one, uh, one of the sites that the students uh, came up with, but I'm an urban planning guy. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, the students in my program had an opportunity to be a part of it. And it was really a, a great, uh, great class. Um, this might be a bit subjective, but what is your I think that the best way to support them is to visit them and to make sure that um, when they have products and things on sale that you go there. A lot of restaurants, uh, a lot of black businesses are typically uh, uh, food, food businesses that have pride their hand in opening up, um, but they don't get like um, the business. When they first open up, you know, you got a lot of people to come, but then over time, you know, people stop coming. And uh, so what we have to do is continue to support those businesses. Um, I'm from New York, and um, when I go uh, to New York, I like to do um, a, a restaurant that's been around forever called Sylvia's. It's a black business. They have little jazz set. They have soul food, you know, and uh, now when you go there, there's more white people in that place than there is black people because it's such a, a brand and a stable. And I think that we have to start supporting uh, women-owned, not just black businesses, but brown businesses and other businesses so that Madison can be that collective, you know, uh, where um, 
you know, you could be proud to take, let me take you over here and get you some soul food. You know, we have a guest coming into town. Let me take you over here to the Center of Black Excellence to that field to really look at, you know, history of Madison and other places. So I think that Madison can be greater when we, when, when we support uh, a multitude of business. Other questions? We got pizza and food here, so we're gonna be here all night. Mm -hmm. Hey. Yeah. So, so I, I own uh, two businesses, which I didn't say. I own a, a, a barbecue business called Ruben Smoke Meat, and uh, I was at the uh, state fair um, for um, uh, five seasons. I have I have a consulting business where I advise um, governments and institutions about like supply diversity and other issues. With the um, business, uh, when you're a business owner, um, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get started, but there's nothing like uh, seeing your idea come to life and your idea, you know, um, puts you in a position where you can earn uh, a living and, uh, you know, be able to take care of your kids and, and, and your family. So I just think that um, business owners are, are special people, um, whether they're farmers, um, you know, or, or whether they're artists and things like that, you know, they take a, a product and they, they bring it to market, you know, and they take a risk, you know, sometimes uh, they might risk their retirement or a mortgage and things like that to make it happen. And people just don't know all the things that these businesses go through to create an economy, you know, in our country. And so it is, um, it's pride, a lot of pride, you know, and, it, but, and then it's what we need uh, in our democracy, right? In capitalism, you know, if we didn't have, uh, entrepreneurs that, that are being brave and stepping out there and thinking uh, when nobody else thinks that they can be successful, but they can put out a product and turn it into something really special uh, for a market and then uh, to reap the rewards for themselves and their families, uh, that's the ultimate thing uh, to do. Question in the back. You said that that's why I take the blood of attention right now, but do you have any other exciting projects coming up? <laughs> You're pretty pushy. Um, look, so yeah, yeah, so we got um, uh, uh, we just did the uh, the, the home ownership program, and um, you know we're doing we, we call it housing 2.0. We did one housing program where we had low income housing tax credits, where it was a 15 year lease to own program, and uh, with that program, uh, you were a homeowner right away. And our housing 2.0, we use new market tax credits, and um, we're able to make people homeowners from day one. But as I mentioned, um, space is scarce in Madison. So affordable housing is like, you know, not available, you know, and even rental um, spaces uh, for families uh, affordable is not, you know, here. So I, I had a, a board retreat uh, this morning and we were talking about, you know, things we should stay in and things we should stay out. When I first came on to the Urban League, my board encouraged me that uh, we're getting out of housing. And I'm like, there's no way you have to fire me. There's no way that we're going to get out of housing when it's a 2% vacancy rate here. Brown black people, um, single mothers can't find, you know, a place to live, you know, and people can't find home ownership. You know, that is the fight. That's where we'll stay. Um, you know, so now maybe we'll shift to uh, a condominium development where um, it's a, a, a building with uh, 100 different uh, um, spaces in it. But giving people home ownership as a condo owner, maybe um, you know the uh, the next um, route that we take or the next project that we do, and so it's infill development, you know. And how do we get into that space uh, to make um, uh, own home ownership, you know, available uh, to uh, medium and poor families in in, in the city? So I had one question, but now I have two questions. All right, let's do uh, it. The first question is, what's your favorite regional barbecue? <laughs> you know, when, when you actually do uh, barbecue, you really become a, a critic and you <laughs> are really uh, skeptical about like eating um, other people's barbecue. But I do like um, this new place on the, on the west side, um, the uh, uh, City Barbecue, I think it's called. They got a really good product. And then on... Um, North uh, Northport Drive, there's um, a butter. It's called a uh, something butter barbecue. They've got a pretty good product, but they're really expensive. 
Uh, so a few places here. I actually like uh, Sanders Stage, you know, too, even though it's like, uh, um, you know, it's big box, you know, type of, uh, you know, thing. But um, yeah, so, but I'm really particular about, I don't usually want to try someone else's barbecue because I don't think they can do it as good as me. You know, mm -hmm. so. What I meant to is, uh, are you particular to any kind of like Kansas City, Carolina barbecue? Like, what's uh, do you have a different personal favorite Texas? Yeah, yeah. So I've never had um, Carolina um, barbecue. Um, Kansas City, um, I guess, is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like my the style of barbecuing that I like is a backyard barbecue style that's traditional um, barbecue. I don't like the um, um, I don't like the seasoned salt or, or or the different rubs that they put on it. I just like uh, um, a, a barbecue entity that can smoke, you know, and and put the right amount of hickory, you know, on that barbecue and have it tender, uh, you know, uh, for a person. My my other question was. Uh... It's, um, so a lot of us are here because we care in some way or another about sustainability or the concept of sustainability, and especially mm -hmm. what that means on our campus. But I'm just curious, um, from your vantage point, your perspective in Madison, um, like what is what is a sustainable Madison community look like to you? Yeah. So for our black business hub, uh, we're putting solar, you know, on the uh, ceiling, and uh, we're using uh, community members to help uh, install the solar. Um, we work with the um, with, with, with the Energy Foundation, and we do uh, EJ uh, environmental justice work, and uh, we're challenging, um, you know, the um, energy and and uh, other folks uh, about you know how um, poor communities are left out. Uh, for example, uh, on Thanksgiving in Milwaukee, uh, my my father-in-law is 94 years old. The lights go out. We don't hear anything from anybody in the city. Happened in the summer um, too, and the lights were out for several days, and it was like temperatures, you know, ninety something degrees. But the folks in the rich area, uh, River Hill, you know, um, they didn't have that same problem. And so I would challenge, like, the Public Service Commission. I would challenge um, the energy companies about, you know, how do you look out, you know, uh, for those folks uh, when something doesn't go right or when something goes wrong. Um, how do you look out for those folks to make sure uh, um, that they are okay? Um, so I, I think that, you know, we have to create more um, uh, energy um, saving jobs and, and we really have to think about, you know, how we are um, not only living today, um, but how do we save this lifestyle um, for um, the next generation, our kids and our grandkids so that, um, they don't have um, pollution and they don't have um, limitations uh, to um, living, that they don't have to walk around with uh, mask, oxygen mask on, or other mask on, that they could have um, a clean water. And like, I'm a fisher, I, I fish, and, uh, um, but you know, you've got PFAS, you know, uh, in the water, right? And so what are we doing uh, so that we can have um, uh, um, clean lakes, you know, and things like that. So I think that, you know, as people that really care about sustainability, um, we have to think beyond today and we have to think about, you know, how we have and make a better future uh, for the next generation. You're exhausting your questions? Um, I was just, you might have mentioned this, but where are you planning to get the rest of your money? From you guys. <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, we are constantly um, you know presenting um, a presentation um, like this today and uh, meeting with different sectors. I have um, a campaign uh, finance committee. Um, we meet every Friday and we talk about places where we should go and tell the story about you know the impacts of um, this black business hub. And so um, anywhere that someone would listen and uh, they they might want to um, make a contribution, we'll go and tell the story about, you know, um, how we're going to change things and then how valuable this is going to be uh, for the region. Uh, in June, we'll have a public phase of our campaign where we'll be uh, appealing to um, regular people in the community saying, like, you know, um, $100, $200, and all these other things, like a 
thousand dollars will make a difference in helping us get through um, the finish line. Other questions? Any other questions? If not, we can respect your time anyway. Five minutes till seven. So if we want to wrap it up and give one more round of applause for Dr. Anthony for coming in, giving us time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Are you kind?